In June 1853, the South Carolina newspaper, the Charleston Southern Standard, published an editorial titled The Destiny of the Slave States. It perfectly reflected the brimming confidence among pro-slavery Southerners that, far from being a backward institution that had no place in a rapidly modernizing American republic, slavery was the wave of the future. The author extolled the virtues of slavery and declared that the U.S. should reopen the transatlantic slave trade. Furthermore, the U.S. should shift its foreign policy to ally itself more closely with the second largest slave society in the world, Brazil, to promote and protect slavery throughout the Western Hemisphere and beyond. Slavery, the editorial concluded, was, quote, the true progress of civilization. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more... huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody is free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History is about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 48, in which we learn how in the decades before the Civil War, pro-slavery Southerners dominated U.S. foreign policy and promoted a vision of an ever-expanding empire of slavery, both within the United States and also throughout the Western Hemisphere. We are coming to you this week from the Filibuster Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and our new YouTube channel. The head chef in charge of cooking up each episode of this podcast is our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Well, happy holidays, everyone. For those of you who celebrate Hanukkah or Christmas, I hope you had a delightful holiday. And for everyone, happy new year. The arrival of the new year and the impending second anniversary of this podcast launch has me thinking a lot about what transpired this past year. For the podcast, it's been a very eventful year. We managed to produce 29 episodes. These included episodes on the history of mass incarceration, the Spanish-American War, Albert Cashier, the transgender soldier who fought in the Union Army, and the school integration crisis in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. The two most popular episodes, as measured by the number of downloads, were my interview with Michael J. Hogan about his book, published in conjunction with the 100th anniversary of the birth of JFK, The Afterlife of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a biography. But by far the most popular episode was the one featuring my interview with documentary filmmaker Ken Burns about his new documentary on the Vietnam War. Looking ahead to 2018, I can promise you many, many more interesting and varied episodes of In the Past Lane. I plan to produce more than 29 episodes, that's for sure, and to release them on a more consistent schedule. I'm also planning to roll out some new features for the podcast. One will be something we call the Pit Stop. These will be really short episodes, usually less than five minutes in length. You'll start to see them in your podcast feed very soon. Another thing you'll notice is that there'll be new opportunities to help support the podcast. First, I'm establishing a Patreon account. This will allow listeners to support the podcast with donations of any size. Now, I should be clear about what these donations are for. I'm not in this podcast enterprise to make any money. But since I have a real job as a full-time college professor, plus lots of other obligations like writing books and public speaking and all that, I'd like to be able to hire a professional editor to edit my interviews and the feature stories I produce. Currently, I do all of this on my own, and as we say up here in Massachusetts, it is wicked time-consuming. So, some financial support from listeners would allow me to outsource this task, which would allow me then to devote more time to the creative side of things. The same is true of advertisers. Our listening community has grown to the point that I've recently been approached by advertisers who are interested in sponsoring the podcast. Again, the kind of income we're talking about here is very, very modest. Just enough to pay for some outsourced editing and maybe a better microphone. I haven't made any decisions on advertisers yet, but I'll keep you posted. Beyond some of these changes to the podcast in 2018, what else can we expect in the coming year? Well, historians are notoriously bad at predicting the future, just like pretty much everybody else. But when the History Channel contacts you to see if you'd like to contribute to a fancy supplement in the New York Times on predictions for 2018, you say yes. (laughs) 
This feature was published on December 24th, and it featured many historians, including some that you've heard on the podcast, like Nicole Hemmer and Natalia Melman Petrozella, but also journalists, artists, and writers whose work touches upon history. The operative question was, what issues will be in the news in 2018 that require some knowledge of history to make sense of them? So, I'm sure you're wondering, what did I predict? I predicted three things, and this is just the headlines. One, political scandals. So, better brush up on Watergate and the Teapot Dome scandals. Two, fake news and freedom of the press. Expect a lot on those two topics, that's to be sure. And three, economic inequality and the fear of entering a second Gilded Age. So the only way to know if we're entering a second Gilded Age is to know a little something about that first Gilded Age. If you want to read the full text of my predictions, plus those of all the other people involved, I'll post a link to this feature on the show page for this episode. Or you could just search for it at history.com. So, hang on a second. Getting a hand signal from Lulu from behind the glass. Lulu, what's up? (sighs) Can you wrap up this intro? I have plans. Right, moving along. You're a young person and it's New Year's weekend. Duly noted. Okay, people. We're going abroad, so time to batten down the hatches. Your journey in the past lane begins now. This episode's main feature is my interview with historian Matthew Karp. But before we get to that interview, let's take a minute to think about some of the background to that period. So here goes. Between 1820 and 1860, the U.S. became an emerging industrial power with the rise of factories, railroads, and large cities. But in those same years, the U.S. enjoyed the status as the world's most prominent slaveholding society. Between 1820 and 1860, the population of enslaved people grew from 1.5 million to 4 million. Cotton production soared from 400,000 bales in 1820 to 4 million bales in 1860. As Southerners like to say, cotton was king. But while slavery grew more prominent and profitable, it also grew more controversial. The abolitionist movement grew more vocal in its condemnation of slavery, and this helped spark controversy after controversy in the 1830s through the 1850s, controversies that often dominated national politics. Most of us remember some of the key ones. The Gag Rule, the Wilmot Proviso, the Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act, Kansas-Nebraska Act, Bleeding Kansas, and the Dred Scott Decision. Throughout these controversies over the future of slavery, pro-slavery Southerners used their political influence to defend slavery and to demand the right to extend it throughout the U.S. But as Matthew Karp makes clear in his new book, these pro-slavery Southerners did not confine their vision of slavery's future to the United States. Not at all. They developed in these decades before the Civil War a bold and enthusiastic vision of slavery's growth and expansion elsewhere in the world. And to make this vision a reality, pro-slavery Southerners did two things. First, they pushed for U.S. territorial expansion, hence the war with Mexico in 1846 that allowed the U.S. to seize what is now much of the western United States. Equally important, they also exerted their political power to use U.S. foreign policy and military power to protect other slaveholding societies like Brazil, Cuba, and in the years before it was annexed by the U.S., the independent slaveholding republic of Texas. One of their top priorities was to thwart the efforts by Great Britain to end the practice of slavery. For centuries, Great Britain was one of the world's foremost participants in slavery and in the international slave trade. But in the early 1830s, Great Britain abolished slavery in its empire and made global abolition a top foreign policy concern. Well, this move infuriated pro-slavery Southerners and made them suspect British plots at every turn, plots they were prepared to foil using U.S. power. To cite one example, in the summer of 1843, reports of a British plot to instigate a slave revolt in Cuba reached the U.S. State Department. The administration of John Tyler, a decidedly Southern and pro-slavery administration, leapt into action to prop up Cuba, its sister slaveholding society. A U.S. Navy squadron was dispatched to Cuba as a show of military force and support of the Cuban government. No insurrection plot ever materialized, but Cuban officials were reassured that in the event of future British meddling, the U.S. would protect Cuba and its vast system of slavery. A few years later, in 1849, Cuba was again on the minds of pro-slavery Southerners. Only this time, they were planning to annex the island and its half-million slaves. To pull this off, they turned to a tactic used in the annexation of Texas just a few years earlier. Texas, of course, had been part of Mexico, but a rebellion led by Americans who had migrated there led to Texas gaining its independence in 1836. Nine years later, the United States annexed Texas. So for Southerners hoping for a replay in Cuba, 
Step one was to foment a rebellion against Spanish colonial rule in Cuba. To bring this about, they sponsored three so-called filibuster invasions of Cuba. These were fleets of private ships filled with American men, mostly Southerners, but a good many Northerners as well, who had volunteered as soldiers. And the idea was they would land in Cuba and engage the Spanish military, and that would then lead to a great popular uprising in support of Cuban independence. Well, the first of these filibusters, three ships and 600 men, was commanded by a colorful Venezuelan-born adventurer named Narciso Lopez. It was stopped by U.S. officials, and it never reached Cuba. Undeterred, Lopez organized a second filibuster expedition. This one took off in May of 1850, again with three ships and 600 men. They landed in Cuba, briefly gained a foothold, but then were driven off the island by the Spanish military. Lopez launched a third attempt in August of 1851, but it was also quickly defeated. Only this time, the Spanish executed Lopez and more than 50 of his soldiers. Despite Lopez's failure, filibuster fever remained strong in the 1850s, and similar ill-fated expeditions were launched against other Latin American nations. And pro-slavery Southerners continued to eye Cuba and push for plans to purchase or to seize the island and its massive slave economy. So you get the idea. While pro-slavery Southerners defended slavery and pushed for its expansion within the United States, they also used American power to defend slavery in places far beyond U.S. borders and to push for its global expansion. Don't go anywhere, people. In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We'll be right back with my interview with Matthew Karp. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. Welcome back to In the Past Lane. With me now is Matthew Karp. He is an assistant professor of history at Princeton University, and I'm speaking with him today about his book, This Vast Southern Empire, Slaveholders at the Helm of American Foreign Policy, published by Harvard University Press. Matthew Karp, welcome to In the Past Lane. Happy to be here. Well, your book, to say the least, is a real eye-opener. I found it really fascinating and thought I knew a lot about slavery in pre-Civil War period as a historian, but this was a real eye-opener. And the biggest thing was that, you know, I think everybody familiar with a reasonable amount of American history is familiar with the idea that Southerners had disproportionate political power in the antebellum period. But most of the time we see that as power that's exercised exclusively in the domestic sphere to essentially defend slavery. But your book looks at a realm that has long been overlooked, which is that of foreign affairs. So I'm wondering if you could start us off by talking about Southern political power and how and why people like John C. Calhoun, Jefferson Davis, and others took a really keen interest in U.S. foreign policy, especially as it related to slavery in the wider Western Hemisphere. Yeah, that's a great sort of succinct framing of one of the book's main arguments. It's interesting because I think you're right that for a long time, ever since really the time of the anti-slavery movement itself, people have been counting the amount of offices held by slaveholders and itemizing lists of the ways that slaveholders filled power centers in the Republic before the Civil War. But the nature of that power and sort of what direction it bent and what slaveholders wanted to do with the power granted to them by the Three-Fifths Clause, by the Democratic Party, et cetera, et cetera, is something that in some ways has been less well studied. I feel like we tend to think of slaveholders as wanting to use their national power essentially in a kind of defensive way to protect their section, to protect the slave South, their property rights as slaveholders, the system of white supremacy in in the entire United States, but in the South in particular. And we don't really look beyond the boundaries of the United States, except that slaveholders want to expand slave territory. Right. But in fact, the compass of this was a lot broader than either just a defensive struggle to sort of protect their region or a sort of simple-minded quest to sort of gobble up more land and put more slaves and slaveholders on it. In some ways, the most pronounced thing I think my book tries to argue about slaveholders in positions of power in foreign policy is the way in which they sought to augment the power of the United States more generally in, in international affairs as a way to protect and expand slavery's power generally in international affairs. There are a lot of specific things that they did over the course of the 1840s and 50s 
that were much more variegated and comprehensive than just grabbing up new land to put more slaves and elect new slave senators. Right. So let's widen the lens here a little bit and get into some of those details. So one thing is that you point out is that there are four great slaveholding powers in the Western Hemisphere. The United States is the most powerful and wealthy of the four. But there's also Brazil, there's also Cuba, and then, which is always, we know this, but then it's surprising when you put it in this context, there's Texas, right? the independent republic of Texas. And there's a lot of interests that are vying for the fate of Texas. And we should back up and point out that Great Britain in the 1830s, up until the 1830s, was one of the great figures in the international slave trade and so forth. And then in 1833, they abolished slavery in their empire. So there's great fear on the part of these southern slaveholding interests that Great Britain is going to use its power to push abolitionism globally. At a certain point, they realize that Texas might actually be vulnerable to that. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So the story of Texas and the annexation of Texas is not unfamiliar. But I do think when we think about Texas, it folds kind of naturally into a history of American expansion, westward expansion. Uh, there's sort of territories that over the course of the 19th century, the United States sort of subsumed. And of course, under the Polk administration, Texas was formally brought into the Union. And, you know, you had California and Oregon, and Texas fits in naturally with those places in our sort of historical imagination. But I think you're right. The book really wants to see Texas not as something that's very different from Mexican California or disputed territory of Oregon, but after 1835, an independent slaveholding state in a hemisphere, which was in some ways whose central political conflict was between slaveholding regimes and Central ideological conflict, slaveholding regimes, that is Texas, yes, yeah, Spanish Cuba, the Empire of Brazil, and the United States, and the anti slavery power of Great Britain. So when the United States moves in the early 1840s under the Tyler administration, dominated by slaveholders, John Tyler of Virginia, his Secretary of State, Abel Upshur of Virginia, and then later John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who really engineer this Texas annexation process. Of course, they want the land. Of course, they want to add another slave state. And of course, they want to sort of expand American borders. But in some ways, the motivating incident for annexation and the defining thread that I think shaped how and why annexation played out is this global conflict between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces, which I describe as a kind of 19th century Cold War, you know, in a sense that it was both an ideological and a strategic conflict over sort of what the future would look like in this hemisphere. Would the economic, the political, the social future of all these places from Maryland to, you know, from the Potomac to the Amazon, in effect, be defined by racial slavery and bound labor or some form of free labor, emancipation, abolition? And Texas, you know, to stick with that Cold War metaphor, is a big domino in this struggle. Exactly, yeah. And they talk about it in those terms. You know, if we lose Texas, well, you know, slavery is going to fall in Cuba and Brazil too, and then the United States will be surrounded. It's a lot of the same logic that's operating in these slaveholders' heads. So what is it that makes them fear that Britain has this kind of influence, that Britain could actually flip Texas to becoming an anti-slavery power? Yeah. To your question, the most obvious thing is that Britain is the largest superpower in the 19th century world, the largest navy the wealthiest economy, and the kind of prime mover in the 19th century Atlantic, certainly, just geopolitically and commercially. So if Britain is going to throw all its influence against a relatively small, newly established, and really, frankly, very weak state of Texas, you know, slavery, of course, the majority of, you know, sort of white Texans were strongly in support of slavery, or at least the Texan political elite were largely slaveholders and wanted to keep slavery. But they weren't very well established. They were threatened by Mexico from the southern borders of Texas. And if Britain was to potentially offer Texas a kind of security guarantee, real recognition and protection of Texan independence in return for a kind of pledge to move towards gradual anti-slavery, well, that's not totally unthinkable that Texas might want to take that bargain. And certainly American slaveholders were afraid that Texas would flirt with that option. Sam Houston, the Texan president, did actually admit that he coquetted quote unquote, in his words with Britain over this. So this is a possibility anyway, even if it ultimately was probably not very likely, it certainly seemed like a real threat. And it's where I think that comparison with the Cold War, this idea of dominoes, that if Texas goes, then maybe slavery is imperiled throughout the Western Hemisphere. That's a really interesting, an interesting idea. It helps frame it in a way that people in the 20th and 21st century can picture it. So ultimately, though, Southerners at the helm of U.S. foreign policy managed to annex Texas. So they solve that problem. What else is going on in this, in this period where we see this pro-slavery internationalism at work? 
and really directing U.S. foreign policy? In the first half of the book, it's really framed by this conflict between, you know, pro-slavery U.S. and anti-slavery Britain, viewed as a kind of strategic and ideological conflict. And for the Southerners, especially in this 1840s period, Texas is certainly probably the most important struggle. But there are a couple chapters in the book where I look at the way that slaveholders generally were really at the forefront of military reform and expansion across the 1840s and 50s. The Navy was a really important place, was totally dominated by Southern secretaries of the Navy. The key committees in Congress were led by slaveholders to sort of pass through funds for naval expansion and modernization. And they really saw the Navy as an important asset in this struggle against hemispheric anti-slavery to project American power, prop up the Cuban slave regime, which was under threat from Britain or from internal slave revolt and could kind of also provide a buffer around the American Gulf Coast. So the Navy's a really important part of this pro-slavery story. And Jefferson Davis also plays a role in modernizing or tries to modernize the U.S. Army as well. So you talk about ironies. Jefferson Davis serves in the 1850s as probably the most efficacious and forward-looking, modernizing, activist U.S. Secretary of the War, brings in a lot of the weapons including the rifled musket and the Minet ball, a lot of the weapons that would sort of define Civil War combat, really significantly strengthens in some ways the kind of core organization in the U.S. War Department and the U.S. Army. And of course, those forces are in a much stronger position, although still minuscule compared to the Civil War armies. But the same War Department that he builds up then turned against him in the Civil War. It's really interesting, and I think it's been missed as a pretty important theme in Annabelle and U.S. history how focused on U.S. military power these supposedly sectional slaveholders were. That's right. You point out that they're sectionalists in domestic politics, but they're nationalists with a capital N on the global stage. And this is part of that, their projection of U.S. power and projection of U.S. power in defense of slavery, as we mentioned about Texas, but also Cuba and Brazil. They really see themselves as the defenders against this menace from Great Britain defending these other slave societies, that it's important for those societies to flourish so that the United States society would be protected and would flourish as well. Yeah, they see a lot of kinship, solidarity maybe, with these other slave regimes. I mean, in some ways, it's not a complete sense of solidarity because American slaveholders still see themselves as superior to the monarchical empire of Brazil or Spanish Cuba, which is still a colony. And, you know, they're hardly great fans of the power of the, of the Spanish crown or anything like that. But on the level of slaveholder to slaveholder, not state to state, but slaveholder to slaveholder, they really see their counterparts in the Atlantic world as belonging to, a, I would say, a sort of community, a kind of imagined community of slaveholders. And they may not have a lot of immediate connection to individual Brazilian slaveholders. But when slavery in these places is threatened, slaveholders are, are very quick to assert slavery as actually the ingredient that has allowed the Brazilian or Cuban economy to flourish, and very quick, so on an ideological level, to defend slavery in those places, and then also very quick to sort of mobilize U.S. power and use the State Department or the Naval Department to try to sort of defend slavery in those places when it's under threat, whether it's a Cuban slave rebellion or whether it's Britain putting pressure on Brazil over the abolition of slavery. American slaveholders are there fighting back. It's interesting. This is a real, like you said, an ideological idea. It's not just financial, that they want to protect the enormous wealth that is bound up in slavery, but they really believe in this slavery project and believe it not only as a national project, but a, an international one. They believe, I think at one point you say something to the effect that they think of history as moving in their direction, that they are they're on the right side of history. There are these competing outcomes, you know, possible outcomes with this new modernizing, globalizing, industrializing global economy. But they are intent on making sure that slavery remains a part of that. That's interesting. Could you tell us a little bit more about the way they see the world in that regard? The big chronological shift in the book, I think, happens around the annexation of Texas and the U.S. war with Mexico in the mid, really the late 1840s. And I think those two events, combined with some parallel events in Europe, really changed the landscape in the Atlantic world. So whereas the early 1840s is dominated by this sense of a kind of Cold War-like conflict between pro-slavery, which in some ways is really on the defensive, as Britain has recently abolished slavery and is kind of making significant efforts at putting anti-slavery pressure on places all throughout the hemisphere, 
after the annexation of Texas, the U.S. conquest of Mexico, and in Britain, the passage of the Corn Laws, which kind of cements Britain's commitment to free trade as opposed to protection of an internal economy, you have a, a confluence of political and economic events that seem to actually strengthen slavery's position on the world stage. So that even as, and this is another kind of complexity, even as the anti-slavery movement within the United States grows stronger and slaveholders become sort of more defensive in some ways, although they still remain on the offensive in other ways, in domestic politics, they're actually more confident about slavery's place in this global order. Britain appears to have backed off its kind of strategic commitment to anti-slavery after around 1850. And even more fundamentally, the kind of orientation of the British economy around free trade in these slave-grown staples and the importance of those staples in firing and providing the kind of raw material that fires the engine of industrial development in Britain, in France, in the northern United States, sugar, cotton, coffee, tobacco, rice. These products are all, it's well beyond King Cotton because what unites these products for these Southerners is what I call emperor slavery. Because all of these raw goods, all of which are really important and which dominate not just the American economy, but the Cuban and Brazilian economies, the export economies, they can't be grown without enslaved labor, without enslaved racialized labor. And they argue over the course of the 1850s that the world has essentially recognized this in fact, even while it continues to deny while British anti-slavery officials will continue to denounce slavery in moral terms. They're dependent upon slavery economically, and eventually the moral will catch up with the economic, slaveholders predict, with increasing confidence over the 1850s. I think that seems to explain to a large degree why on the eve of the Civil War, one of the things in you know, Southern calculus in, in creating the Confederacy and seceding was this notion that Great Britain is poised to ally with them, poised to step in on their behalf because Great Britain had really backed off of that global abolitionist posture that they had upheld for 20 years anyway. So to what extent does that explain, I mean, you talk about secession as a foreign policy move as opposed to just a first step in a civil war. Tell us a little bit more about that part of the story that's towards the end of your book. So to elaborate a little more on this sense of international confidence that slaveholders had, I mean, their view of the world by the, by the late 1850s, as we got closer to Lincoln's election in 1860, really confirms this confidence. You know, you have a series of world events and world developments, even beyond the kind of narrowly economic kind of confirms their sense that slavery is here to stay internationally. The kind of expansion of European empires, which really starts to ratchet up in the late 1850s after the Indian mutiny in India, for instance, Britain has really begun to consolidate its empire in South Asia. The French have moved into North Africa and even West Africa with increasing intensity. And all of these imperial ventures that are all over the world seem to sort of confirm, in a sense, the the crude logic of racial domination, which has become an increasingly fundamental part of the justification for slavery. And at the same time, sort of racial science has evolved over the course of the 1850s, not in the South so much, although there are some, you know, plenty of quack doctors in the South who have racial theories of their own, but in places like Harvard University, where Louis Agassiz is signed off on fundamental theories of racial inequality or in Paris and in the universities in England and Scotland. These, in some sense, sort of intellectual and geopolitical developments really strengthen the South's belief that when the push comes to shove and Lincoln is elected and they're ejected from power on the national level, which they've held so tightly to, that the world, in effect, is ready for a pro-slavery republic. I mean, I think you have to think about that. Why would this, so often the Confederacy is depicted as a kind of secession, as like a kind of a desperate last chance gamble that was greeted with a universal condemnation of the world because slavery is obviously a relic of barbarism in the past. But I think you have to understand how in the Southern worldview, in the pro-slavery worldview, there are all these other global factors that are sort of pushing towards an acceptance of racial hierarchy and labor coercion. And that the South doesn't look quite so exceptional as sometimes historians depict. And slaveholders certainly didn't see themselves as quite so exceptional. And they believe that they would find France, maybe not an immediate military alliance, but they certainly hope for that. But they certainly didn't see themselves as sort of out of place or out of step in this world order. And that this independent slaveholding republic would really join upon the arena of nations, as Alexander Stevens said, kind of grandly, and be greeted as a rightful member. It's a really great example of how subsequent events shape the way we see that the 1850s and secession 
it looks so, as you say, like a desperate move. It looks like the world is obviously, you know, the, the South is in some ways standing alone as this would-be slave republic, but not in 1859, 1860, 1861. They, they had a f- realistic vision of the world and, and their, their potential place in it. I think that's really interesting. Would you say it is due to the way we read backwards in some ways? Absolutely. When the Republican Party called slavery a relic of barbarism in its, you know, 1856 platform, kind of famously. But that wasn't, we sort of accept that now as a given, or at least most of us do, accept that slavery should be regarded as a relic of barbarism. But that was a bold and aggressive statement on the part of that party that was really challenging, kind of painting slavery as something that was archaic and, you know, backward looking. Yeah, out of step. Right. We have to remember that's a propaganda campaign, you know, it was a really successful one. But slavery wasn't out of step in the sense that it was making slaveholders richer than ever. It was entrenched in political power. It had to be defeated through this political struggle. It wasn't going to just go anywhere on its own. And I think the behavior of slaveholders in this moment really testifies to that confidence. It's a really fascinating time period because we've talked mostly about this kind of global or international protection and upholding of slavery. But there's a huge debate within the United States, a huge effort on the part of Southerners domestically to create a pro-slavery narrative as well, to convince Northerners essentially to not really worry about slavery, to not pay attention to the abolitionists. So there's sort of a two-front propaganda war that's, that's taking place that ultimately reaches ahead during the Civil War. The big thing for slaveholders I mean, really, the election of Lincoln is, is so vital. And, you know, why is that? Why? I mean, if you Yeah, think the of, mere election. Right. I mean, I think it's worth reemphasizing that when we narrate the sectional conflict in terms of the kind of balance of power in Congress or in the Senate, and we make that the kind of central frame of analysis, like who has more slave states, who has more free states, like who can pass a bill to abolish slavery, or who can't, who can extend slavery, who can't, all those questions get decided in various ways a lot earlier on non-slave members of Congress outnumber slaveholding members of Congress very early in the Republic. By 1850, with the admission of California, the South loses the balance of power in the Senate. There's no, you know, kind of some feeble attempts in 1850 in South Carolina, but it never really gets off the ground. They secede when they lose executive power. They lose the presidency, which had really been the, I think, even more than the Senate was the citadel of Southern power in the Republic, wherein they could control the Navy, the War Department, the military, foreign policy through the State Department. And it's the ejection of Southern power, you know, the replacement of Buchanan with Lincoln is so fundamental to them because they know they have no, they can't worm their way into a Republican administration and control it for the benefit of slavery. There's no hope for them there. This whole imperial colossus that they've helped build is now going to turn against them. It's a really fascinating moment where they really sense crisis and and are going to do something that, again, we look back on and say that's essentially a suicidal move, you know, to break away, to try to become an independent slave republic. But given their understanding of the world and their understanding of U.S. politics, it did make sense and seemed like really in some ways the only option, which is really interesting to consider. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the South only as a place that was sort of only interested in self-defense, and the protection of a certain way of life or the protection even of their slave system and local government, states' rights, et cetera, then secession makes no sense because there was no immediate threat to end slavery in the South. I mean, the Republicans had a plan that they wanted to ultimately whittle away at slavery, to be sure, but slaveholders could certainly have fought for slavery within the Union quite effectively. But what they did lose and what they lost any chance of doing is ruling the national government. And I think that national ambition of the pro-slavery sort of master class was in some ways one of their defining characteristics, not just as defensive, a sort of regional ruling class that just wanted to maintain its social rule over the state of Georgia, but actually to manipulate the power of the whole United States. And when they lose that, they take their ball and go home. They are a kind of master class in the sense that I think they see themselves as they have to reign or die. In effect, they're not satisfied with just waging a defensive war against anti-slavery within the Union. Particularly looking back over the what they would see as at least a 30-year internal war with abolitionists. And I think, you know, one of the sort of widening the lens here a little bit to sort of look at this, the larger picture, I think one of the things that strikes me when looking at the big story is that, you know, most Americans, when they, when they think about sort of the shorthand version of history, think about Jefferson in 1776 and the Declaration of Independence, and that that, even though imperfectly and incomplete, 
uh, he lays down this this liberty marker and the declaration about all men are created equal, and that for the next four score and seven years, the United States struggles to fulfill that, ultimately ending in emancipation in 1863. And, you know, your book makes clear that it's really, that's not the case, that this doesn't, there's no inevitability here. This is a something that is struggled and fought over because these are fundamentally different visions of what the United States will look like as it approaches the 20th century. That's so true. I think what Jefferson Davis thought of Thomas Jefferson was very different from than what Abraham Lincoln thought. There's no question about it. And those visions, not only were they not compatible, they were, you know, militantly and then ultimately militarily opposed. Right. It does exp- help us explain how we ultimately get to, to 1861 and then even beyond. And maybe that's where we should wrap things up. I always ask people who I interview, you know, first acknowledging that history is fascinating in and of itself and the people involved and the events that take place are worthy of study. But, you know, I think it's really important for history to have something to say about us now. You know, it, it needs to be a resource to us in some way. So what do you think as we sit here in 2017, what is this story of the pre-Civil War period and U.S. foreign policy and debates over slavery and internationalism. What's important for people now to know about that? I guess I would say two things. The first kind of more tangible, the safe lesson that I think is unquestionable and important. I think certainly one thing that the book does in the midst of this controversy that is swept across the country about the role of slavery and white supremacy in American history, I think one thing the book does, it's hardly alone in doing this, but I think it does it in a different way, is to just sort of affirm how important and how deep the roots of slavery in American politics are. Not just in the Confederate South, you know, the characters in my book largely hailed from the Southern states and were slaveholders themselves, but because they controlled national power, I think we need to remember and center our understanding of slavery in a national context, not just as a kind of local or regional story. And this vast Southern empire was not the Confederacy, it was the United States. And That's the first one. The second thing, which is a little bit more optimistic, maybe, but for me, I think really important, it's that these slaveholders were, the book argues, in the antebellum period, effectively America's ruling class, yet they were defeated. This was a ruling class that put protection of slave property and the defense of slave institutions across the hemisphere as its sort of number one political priority and organized everything else around that. And they ruled the country for decades, in effect through the Democratic Party, et cetera. And yet the political movement did rise within the United States that toppled them, that overthrew the slave power. And of course, that led to a civil war that was unimaginably tragic and horrible. And we don't necessarily want to make that the model for how to make things better today. But the example of the anti-slavery movement in effectively toppling this ruling class from power is, I think, something that people today, however besieged and hopeless the political scene looks right now, can look to with some sense of inspiration. I agree with that completely. And I think also the one takeaway there is that change doesn't happen overnight. You know, the abolitionist movement and the rise of the Republican Party, that's a many decades long Mm -hmm. initiative. So that what makes things frustrating for people involved in politics and activism, I think, is that they want results to occur quickly. And in this case, we realize that history uh, does move, but it moves slowly and it moves at the behest of you know people taking action. Yeah, and it moves in fits and starts. This is to quote another kind of revolutionary entirely, I guess. Didn't Lenin say something like, there are decades where nothing happens and then there are days where decades happen yes. or something like that? You know, I think that's true of this American struggle over slavery, where in some ways the abolitionist struggle was a very, very long burn, decades and decades of struggle against this institution. But at the same time, the Republican Party coheres and takes state power in six years. So things can happen very slowly and things can happen very quickly. Indeed. Well, I think that's a great spot to leave it. Matthew Karp, thanks so much for talking to us. Your book is really interesting and very well written and compelling read. So hopefully uh, people will go out and pick it up and you'll, you'll move a lot of books. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot. That's, that's really what it comes down to, I guess. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, this was a great conversation and I appreciate you having me on. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Matthew Karp is author of This Vast Southern Empire, Slaveholders at the Helm of American Foreign Policy, published by Harvard University Press. You can find Matt on Twitter at MJ. That's at K-A-R-P-M-J.
right, everyone. Time to close out this episode of In the Past Lane. As always, thanks for listening. To learn more about the stuff we discussed in this episode, just go to our show page at inthepastlane.com. There you'll find recommended readings, links, and more. And people, please, send us your comments, questions, and suggestions via Twitter, where I tweet as at In the Past Lane, and Instagram, same thing, In the Past Lane, and Facebook at In the Past Lane Podcast. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, got any New Year's resolutions? Yes, for you to get your shit together. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 